Hello everyone, this is Sohail Behnajan and today I'm going to talk about sublinear time algorithms for matching and vertex cover. So let me start actually by uh, reminding you what matching and vertex covers are. So matching is a su subset of um, vertex disjoint edges. So here um, the red edges form a matching in the graph. And a vertex cover is a set of vertices such that every edge has at least one endpoint in the set. So here, for example, the red vertices form a vertex cover because every edge that we take in the graph has at least one, uh, one vertex that's, that's red. Um, and typically we are interested in matchings of large size uh, or, or maximum matching or a minimum or a vertex cover of small size or minimum vertex cover. And, and today um, we study algorithms that given a graph G determine the size of maximum matching or minimum vertex cover in time that's sublinear in the size of the graph G. And, and let me fix some of the notation that I'll be using right away. I'll use M to denote the number of vertices, M to denote the number of edges, delta for the maximum degree in the graph and D bar for the average degree in the graph. Um, so when we talk about sublinear time algorithms, it's very important to actually specify how the input is represented because you're only going to access a small fraction of the input. Two models of, are common for graph problems, um, the adjacency list model and the adjacency matrix model. We study both models in this work. Um, and, and as I said, given a graph G, our goal is to determine the size of maximum matching or minimum vertex cover by querying a sublinear number of entries of say either the adjacency uh, list or the adjacency matrix of the graph. And other than the query complexity, there's also a notion of time complexity. Once you query a subset of entries, um, you can maybe spend more time processing them. But in this work, everything that I talk about time complexity is linear in, in uh, query complexity. So I not distinguish the two. Um, just a quick reminder, the adjacency list model for every vertex, we have a list of its neighbors. Um, and in the adjacency matrix model, we have a matrix and by a matrix, every entry determines whether two um, vertices are um, adjacent or not. Uh, it's, it's a zero one matrix. And, and there's some uh, trivial bounds for, for the two models. So in the, in the adjacency matrix model, we can query every entry of the matrix in n squared time, learn the whole graph, and then estimate the size of maximum matching or minimum vertex cover. Um, in the adjacency list model, we can query all the entries of these lists in O of n time or, or with O of n queries, um, because m is the number of um, uh, edges in the graph as, and also an upper bound on the number of entries of these lists. Um, good. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that to approximate the size of maximum matching, uh, to find um, uh, any constant approximation of matching or minimum vertex cover, um, these trivial bounds are actually optimal. But the key word really is, is finding. Um, to find the edges of the matching or the vertices of the vertex cover, we actually have to spend this much time. So maybe it's possible um, just for estimating the size of the two uh, properties, we can take uh, sublinear time. And indeed, this, is, this will be the case, as you will see. So let me actually start by, by giving some more um, informative lower bounds for the size of matching or minimal vertex cover. I'll start by multiplicative approximations in the adjacency matrix model. Um, it turns out that obtaining any multiplicative approximation in the adjacency matrix model requires omega n squared queries. And here is a simple reason. Suppose that the graph is either empty. We are promised that the input is either empty or includes one random edge. We have to distinguish the two for, for any multiplicative approximation. Um, but, then, but distinguishing the two requires n squared queries to the adjacency matrix model. Now, the magic here is very small. So maybe if we allow some epsilon n additive error, um, we can actually easily handle these cases by reporting zero. Um, in fact, for, for allowing um, an additive epsilon n error, the best known lower bound is, is significantly smaller. We, the, the best known lower bound is omega n instead of n squared. And here's, the, here's, here's how the lower bound works. Suppose that the graph is either a random perfect matching or, or, or completely empty. Even if we allow additive epsilon n error, the algorithm has to distinguish the two cases. The vast majority of entries of the adjacency matrix are zeros. There are only n ones out of n squared potentially. And so we have to query omega n of these entries to, to, to distinguish the two cases. In the adjacency list model, I also talk about multiplicative approximations first. Any multiplicative approximation, again, has to distinguish whether the graph is empty or has one edge. And this requires um, querying at least a degree of omega n vertices to find whether there exists an edge in the graph. If we allow multiplicative additive approximations for the agents of the list model, again, we can prove a lower band of omega average degree, but I won't go through it because it's not very related to what I'm going to discuss today. Good. Um, so here's a table of the known lower bounds. We discuss adjacency to list lower bounds, adjacency matrix lower bounds, and both multiplicative approximations and multiplicative additive approximations and, and multiplicative approximations. We saw these three um, omega n and omega n squared lower bounds. Um, these are very simple lower bounds, and, and there's also a lower bound of omega average degree for multiplicative added, additive approximations in the adjacency to list. Good. So now let me quickly overview the related prior work and, and then I, I'll get to uh, my result. So in the most, most of the work has been done in the adjacency list model. Um, 
the original work of Parnas and Ron, which, which really originated the, the study of sublinear time algorithms for matching a perfect discovery, gave um, a quasi polynomial in the maximum degree time algorithm for two comma epsilon and approximating the size of maximum matching the minimum vertex cover. And this quasi polynomial uh, dependence on delta was improved over time. Um, such an important step was, was by Onaka Nguyen who, who obtained a two to uh, delta time algorithm, which is not better, but actually they introduced a new technique of randomness greedy algorithms, which later was used to bring down the query complexity uh, or time complexity down to even polynomial in delta, delta to the power of four in particular by Yoshida et al, which was later uh, improved to delta squared by, by Onak et al in Soto 12. Good. But note that even though there's been this, this remarkable progress, delta squared can still be as large as n squared if delta is linear in the number of vertices. Um, so it's not quite sublinear unless we put some assumption on the structure of the graph and the maximum degree of the graph. If we allow a much larger multiplicative approximation of, say, a very large constant, the recent result of Cabralov et al. actually obtains an off delta time algorithm. So this is what was known for the adjustment list model. For the adjustment in matrix model, um, we only knew a, a recent result of Chen, Kana, and Canon, and, and Kana, which um, presents a two comma epsilon and approximation and root n time. Right, so this, this was the, the known works. Um, here, here in, in this table, I'm only highlighting the two uh, approximations, particularly I'm, I'm not stating the result of Kapralov et al, which, which, is, which takes off delta time. Um, but yeah, so basically for multiplicative approximations in the addresses of this model, nothing was known. For multiplicative additive approximations, the best known bound was average degree times max degree. And in the adjustment matrix model, as we discussed, multiplicative approximations, there's, there cannot be any non-trivial algorithm that n squared is needed and, and is trivial to achieve. Um, but for multiplicative additive approximations, we can't get an n root n time algorithm by result of Chenica. So what we prove in this work is that these, all these lower bounds can actually be matched up to polylogarithmic factors. So for the multiplicative additive approximations, we, we give um, an O tilde of a D bar time algorithm. For multiplicative approximations in the adjustment list model, we give off n time algorithm. And for, for uh, multiplicative additive approximations in the adjustment matrix model, we give an O of um, n time algorithm. Um, and let me actually remark um, that these results hold for both approximating minimum vertex cover and matching, that the approximation factors are going to be the same for both. Um, and that these lower bounds hold more generally for any constant approximation, not just two approximations. And um, in a sense, we, we actually have settled the sublinear minimum vertex cover problem um, because obtaining a better than two approximation is, uh, is not uh, doable in polynomial time on, under um, unique games. All right, um, so now let me uh, tell you a few ideas about how we um, estimate the size of maximum matching in sublinear time. Um, so let us fix a matching M um, of the graph doesn't necessarily have to be a maximum matching, maybe an approximate matching. And suppose that we have an oracle that given a vertex V returns whether V is matched in this matching M that we fix uh, using Q queries. Okay. And then the, the whole framework is as follows. We sample T vertices, both T and Q will be parameters that we'll talk about later. Um, so we sample T vertices, um, each uniformly at random, um, and we run this oracle on them. And we use the uh, uh, number of the vertices that end up being in the matching as, um, as a proxy for how many vertices in the whole graph are part of the matching. To be more precise, uh, this is a fraction of vertices among those sample that are matched. And we multiply this. And we say, okay, so we multiply this by n, this is uh, our estimate of the number of verses in the whole graph that are part of the matching, divided by two because we want to count the number of edges, not the number of verses. All right, and note that here, the, the overall query or time complexity is in the order q times t. q is the query we require per sample, and there are t samples. And for the rest of the talk, really think of t, the number of these samples, as some constant, particularly, for example, for, for a multiplicative additive epsilon and error, um, for, for, for an additive epsilon and error, it turns out that only one over epsilon s squared sample suffices as a simple train of bound. So think of T as something small. For, for multiplicative approximations, T will be a little larger, but still for the purpose of the stock, think of T as, as a constant. So the main question is, what is the query complexity Q for, for this matching M? And I want to note two things. One is suffices to analyze this for the random vertex, not for a worst case vertex. And two, this query complexity depends on how we fix this matching M. We could, for, for some specific matching, this Q could be large. The goal is to fix some matching, which we can actually estimate whether a vertex is part of that matching or not in a small time. Good. So we first have to fix this matching M. 
And to do this, we use the greedy algorithm. So what is a greedy algorithm? We iterate over the edges in some order pi of the edge set and greedily add any edge to the matching upon visiting it in the order uh, pi um, if it's not already adjacent to another matching. So suppose that this, this is the graph, this is the ordering um, uh, illustrated on the edges. So first we process edge one, it is added to the matching, two cannot be added, three is added and so on and so forth until the matching is formed. First note that this matching M is a maximal matching because every edge that's not, it's already adjacent to another edge of the matching. And this immediately implies that we have, a, it, it provides a true approximation for maximal matching and it's vertex that also provides a true approximation for minimum vertex color. So the main question is how can we determine if a vertex belongs to the greedy matching with few queries? Um, and, and the key observation is an edge E is part of this matching if and only if no edge that has a lower rank than E in the permutation pi um, is part of the matching. In other words, when we reach edge E, if none of its incident edges that have lower rank are already in the matching, we put E in the matching. And this naturally raises a, a recursive process for determining whether an edge is part of the matching or not. Um, and, and, and this query process was what Monak and Yuan proposed. And, and then this, this work is actually based on analyzing and providing a better analysis of this, this query process. So what's the query process? So whether we want to know whether edge 11 is part of this, this matching of the greedy algorithm um, in sublinear time. Uh, so here's a query process. Can be can take a large time, but, but here's the query process. Uh, so to determine whether edge 11 is part of the matching or not, uh, we first recursively query whether um, it's lowest rank neighbor is part of the matching. So we first query six. And this six recursively again queries five. We continue querying until we query edge one. Edge doesn't edge one doesn't have any lower rank neighbor. So we immediately realize that one is part of the matching. And this also immediately implies that two is not part of the matching. And then again this implies that three is part of the matching. So on so forth. So we learn at the end that six is not part of the matching. So 11 still has another neighbor to query. We query 10. 10 recursively queries eight first, eight queries seven, seven is in the matching, so on and so forth. We realize that 10 is also not in the matching. And then 11 we realize must be part of the matching, okay? So this is a recursive query process. In this example, it took a long time actually to determine whether 11 is part of the matching or not. But if, for example, we started from edge 12, well, I can confirm that the, this query process would have actually terminated much earlier by, by revealing only a small portion of the query. Good. So the main question is how, how long does this query process take? for a random permutation and for a random starting vertex that we take. In this regard, define Q of an edge E and pi to be the number of edges seen in the query process to determine whether an edge is in the greedy uh, maximal matching and define this similarly for, for vertices. Um, so Onak and Nuan prove that this bound is E to delta for, for, for any vertex E. Um, and the idea basically counts the number of vertices reachable from E for, with monotone paths. So I'm not gonna go, go, go through it. With an elegant analysis, Yoshida, Yamamoto, and Ito actually show that if the starting vertex is a random vertex, unlike the, the, the bound of Onaka and Numan, if it's a random vertex, this can actually be bounded by d bar times max degree. Um, so what we prove in this work um, is a tight bound on this, this uh, parameter Q. So what we show is that for random vertex and a random permutation, Q of V and pi is upper bounded by d bar, the average degree times log n, and is lower bounded by the average degree. So it's up to some logarithmic factor. We, we give a tight analysis of this parameter Q. Although it's not immediate how this Q relates to the, uh, to the query complex or time complexity of the algorithm, but I remark that any bound that one proves for Q, we can actually get an algorithm in time Q times some poly log n. Good, so this leads to an algorithm for estimating the size of maximum matching in time um, average degree times log n in the adjacent to list model, um, um, with multiplicative additive approximations. And I also want to point out that it's open to determine whether or not um, Q for, for an adversarial vertex, for, for now a given vertex, whether it's poly delta is still open and a very nice open question. So now let me also, um, in a few slides, give you some uh, outline of how we prove this upper bound of average GP times log n. Um, so the key idea as in the work of Yoshida uh, is instead of bounding the number of queries out of an edge E, so for example, this edge E starts the query process and reaches all these edges. This is, this is really what we want to uh, understand. Instead of directly bounding the number of queries out of an edge E, we instead bound the number of queries made to the edge. Right? So suppose that you start the query process from every single vertex in the graph, count how many of them and how many times in total um, end up querying E. And, and, and define maybe this, uh, let, let's define this to be P of E and pi. Right? So again, Q is 
if you start a query process from an endpoint of E, how many vertices of the graph you see? Here P is, if you start a query process from every vertex in the graph, how many of them query you? So these are, these are uh, complements of each other. And good, so let me actually skip this. So our analysis for, for bounding Q actually follows from um, um, a bound on, on P, and, and this is how it works. Um, so we would like to prove, um, for fixing an edge D, we would like to prove that the expected value of the number of vertices that query E um, is upper bounded by log N. And to prove this, um, we construct a bipartite graph um, with n factorial vertices on the top, n factorial vertices on the bottom. Each one of these vertices corresponds to the permutation of the edge set of the graph, which will be um, uh, corresponding to the permutation with which the greedy algorithm actually runs. So again, if you call that, we consider a, a, a random permutation. Okay, good. So now fix one of these permutations pi, um, particularly look at the vertex corresponding to pi in part A of this bipartite graph. Now, Take again this edge E, recall again that this, this graph is constructed specifically for, for, for fixing any edge E. And um, so what we prove is that, so, so first let me actually describe the, the, the construction of the bipartite graph. So for every query process that ends up at E, right, so maybe if we start a process from this vertex, it reaches E. Um, we put an edge from pi to some other permutation, right? So as a function of this query path and this permutation pi, we construct another permutation sigma and connect pi from the A part of the part bipartite graph to B. And we continue doing so for every one of these query paths. So for every one of these query paths, we map pi to another permutation of the graph. And note in particular that the degree of pi in the A side is exactly P of E and pi. This is the number of vertices that, and the number of, the total number of times that edge E ends up being queried from, from different vertices of the graph. So the question is, if we pick a random vertex from the A side corresponding to a random permutation of the edge set of the graph, what is the degree of this permutation, which is the number of queries made to edge E? And it turns out to be a hard um, um, task to upper bound directly the degrees in the A side. So what we do instead is we upper bound um, the degree in the B side. To do so, first note that the average degree in the A side is actually equal um, to the average degree in the B side. Because this is a bipartite graph, the two parts have, have equal sizes. Now the key technical contribution of the work is to show that take any permutation sigma in the B side. If its degree is, uh, say let's, if, if we denote its degree by degree of sigma B, then each one of these edges uh, corresponds to a mapping from a query path that all these query paths have different lengths. In other words, if a vertex in the B side, if a permutation in the B side has degree say K, there's one of these edges that is uh, corresponding to a mapping from some permutation pi to sigma, such that the query path resulting in this uh, mapping has length at least k, right? So if, if, if a vertex has degree k, one of its edges uh, corresponds to a query path of length one, one of them query, a query path of length two, and so on and so forth up to k. Um, at least. So there's gonna be at least one that has um, um, length k. And then we complement this by showing that uh, from, from the uh, building on prior work, that the longest query path actually is for a random permutation upper bounded by log n. So if you put these together, these bounds, um, being careful about how uh, good of a high probability bound um, it is, uh, you end up getting that, in fact, the average degree on the B side and also the average degree on the A side is, is log n. So what this implies is that fixing any edge, the total number of queries to that edge for a random permutation is log n. And now, from this, how do we get that the um, query out of a vertex is um, um, is log n for a random vertex? This basically follows from the fact that the total number of queries um, reaching all the edges combined is an expectation m log n. So for every one of these edges, it's log n. So combining all these edges, the total query is m log n. On the other hand, if you pick a random vertex, the query complexity out of that vertex will be m log n divided by n, which is the average degree times log n. And this, this, is, this is the main uh, claim of the paper that, that we proved. All right, to conclude, we proved that all these lower bounds that I discussed earlier are actually tight for the sublinear time uh, model for both maximum matching and minimum vertex cover for obtaining two approximations, either multiplicative evaluative or multiplicative. And, and, and to, to highlight a few open questions, the first is, can we improve the two-factor in the approximations for matching using any sublinear 
uh, and the number of edges of the graph n squared minus any constant. Um, yeah, so, so crucially, this all depends on uh, the greedy algorithm which obtains only a two approximation. So we do not know how to obtain a 1.999 approximation. And the second open problem um, is for the same for minimum vertex cover, although one has to uh, give up on optimizing the time complexity and maybe for, for optimizing query complexity, one can beat to it somehow. Um, but that requires running perhaps an exponential time algorithm. And with that, I'm going to finish the talk. Thank you very much for listening.